Okay, everybody. My name is Samantha Hardingham, Interim Director of the AA uh, for this year, 1718. Um, I am very, very delighted to introduce, very briefly, I should say, so you can get into the meaty conversation, um, this series uh, of conversations about the AA, uh, which have been devised um, by both Mark Morris, our Head of Teaching, and Mark Cousins, our Head of History and Theory, uh, as a way to start to really, um, well, two good reasons why, we, why it's a good moment to do this, to talk about the AA in terms, of its, in terms of architectural education. One reason is the process that we're currently going through for um, applying for degree awarding powers. Uh, it's just a really useful um, way of, of exploring what, what we mean by architectural education when we do it here at the AA um, and to clarify that. And if we can, if clarification is indeed the thing we're looking for. Um, and then also the process of the search for the new director. So those are kind of big events, obviously, for the school this year and really good reasons why um, we should be talking not just about the administrative processes in and around those uh, two mechanisms, which of course are vast, but maybe not so interesting for everybody, but actually the really fundamental reason why both those things are interesting, which are in terms of how we can go about thinking about architectural education now. Um, so this is a good moment to think both, uh, look both inwardly at the AA of what, what we are, but we're also quite good at that at the AA, and perhaps even more effectively what the AA means in terms of the rest of the world. Um, so what, what we are um, externally. Uh, so it ponders the idea of this series every day this week at lunchtime, one o'clock, um, for an hour, is to ponder the past, present and future of architectural education. Um, and particularly here is something unique and valuable. Uh, it's often said about the AA, but perhaps we're wondering why we are unique. Are we indeed still unique? Um, those kinds of questions. Uh, and I should just remind you um, that these are conversations. They're not slideshows. They're not lectures. They're not, uh, you are not a passive audience. You are the uh, school community or members of the school community who are a part of this conversation. So there may be one or two bodies up here um, helping to lead that conversation or initiate it, but this is about the participation of everybody here. Um, whether you have something to say or not, that doesn't matter, but it is not a lecture and it is not um, something that you just have to swallow. <coughs> Uh, so, and it's also supposed to prompt conversation outside of this room. There's obviously a finite amount of time that everyone has at lunchtime. Uh, so please use the beginnings of these conversations as catalysts for conversations in the bar, in the units, everywhere else. This is a short, exciting, very extraordinary moment in time at the school. So just seize it. I'm now going to pass over to Mark and Mark and our special guest, for today, who's going to kick this whole um, thing off is Paul Finch, uh, who I will now let you introduce. Um, if he needs indeed introducing, he oh. might do to a few. Okay, thank you very much thank to you, everybody Samantha. for organizing Thanks. this. Thanks. Thanks, all of you, for uh, joining the conversation. Uh, the format will kick off with a few um, prompts, but I think very much Mark and I hope to open the discussion, and it is a discussion, uh, open it up to the floor. So. We'll kick off with a few uh, maybe key questions for Paul, who I'll introduce in a second, and then see where you would like to take this conversation. Uh, as Samantha says, it's a prompt for other sorts of conversations. We'll see where we get in an hour. Uh, but it is my pleasure uh, to introduce Paul Finch, uh, Program Director of the World Architecture Festival, Editorial Director of Architecture Review and Architects Journal. He's a founding commissioner and deputy chair of the Commission for Architecture in the Built Environment and later um, trustee and deputy chair of the Design Council. He chaired the London Olympics Design pa Review Panel from 2005 to 2012. And then he was elected as a member of AA Council for five years. Paul is an honorary uh, REBA member. In 94, he received an honorary doctorate from the University of Westminster. He has an honorary fellowship at UCL. 
and an honorary membership of this institution. He received an OBE for services to architecture in 2002. It is therefore an honor uh, to welcome Paul Finch with us today. I wanted to um, really open uh, the dialogue with uh, Mark Cousins and Paul around the question of how exactly is the AA exceptional? And Paul's done a little thinking on this before arriving to the room. Uh, but I'd like to turn over to Mark Cousins for some introductory remarks. Uh, okay. Um, I think really, like, you should say what you have kind of almost straight away. Uh, I have one point which will seem kind of quite minor, but I believe to be major, but I'll, I'll let Paul uh, state it. It's, it's a great pleasure that Paul's here. He has always been a kind of redoubtable defender of the AA, or a redoubtable defender of the AA's independence, uh, support given over many decades, and it's the greatest pleasure to welcome him here today as the first of these discussions. Well, <clears throat> both Marks, um, thank you very much for that. You know, I hate those sort of introductions. They start to sound like an epitaph, don't they? But the, um, uh, I spent uh, quite a few um, happy hours at AA Council talking about kind of some of the detail and strategy about how the school was run, how the trust was run. And the observation I would like to make today, really, the overall observation is this that when you get uh, the opportunity for change, which things like a new chairman or chief executive or whatever the title is going to be, um, that opportunity frequently prompts a kind of outbreak of desires on the part of all sorts of people uh, who want to make <coughs> their institution more like something else. In other words, all the things that they might have liked to see under the uh, previous head and didn't happen for one reason or another, for good, bad, or indifferent reasons, the possibility suddenly arises. We might get somebody in who'd be more respectful or uh, more accepting of uh, how I think the world ought to, or the world ought to work. And the problem about this is that it allows that, to me, rather destructive and usually rather pointless exercise, which is, why can't our institution be more like someone else's? And it's tempting, because in a world of cherry-picking and TripAdvisor, couldn't you make a great school by just picking off the best, best bits of 30 other schools and then just do all the best bits and everything would work? Um, and it's rather like, you know, the 30 best main courses, um, you can only eat one at a time. And I think you have to be terribly careful uh, under these circumstances about assuming, firstly, that somehow the things that you're doing that you think may be improvable or that are just wrong loom very large in your mind because you know they're much better than the examples that you're citing where they do these things with so much more elan or so much more efficiency or so much more effectiveness. And actually, you don't really know if that's the case at all. All you do know in detail is about your own institution. And I would just, I would, my, so my word of warning uh, is not to use the occasion uh, of a search to think, to think that basically you're going to recreate your institution in the image uh, of another one. What happens if you go down that path is firstly you begin to dilute the very qualities that your own institution has because by adding those from elsewhere or substituting bits, that's what you're doing, generally speaking. You're diluting, uh, not strengthening. And I personally think that the AA, um, its current and recent history and its long-term history all say to me that the smartest thing the AA can do is to become more like itself and not more like somewhere else. And you know, Lapidus are in the leopard. Uh, everything has to change in order to remain the same. And what is 
the same. Uh, it's not, you know, who teaches what on a Tuesday morning. It is what are the fundamental values and history and kind of uh, philosophy or attitude, actually, a better word from the AA. Uh, what is it that you think is fundamental to this place? I had a pop very, very quickly because Mark asked me to say, OK, just name five things that are different about the AA. And I would scrawled out unit system on the grounds that everyone else did it. I could have put in invented unit system, but in a sense, who cares? It was a long time ago, and if everyone else is doing it, it can scarcely be said to be uh, unique. So I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it's not unique to this place anymore. But the ones I have put down, in no particular order, Hook Park, what a brilliant thing. I don't believe every AA student goes to the Hook Park. You certainly should do. And I think that whole world of materials and timber, let alone um, the architecture of making and a particular sort of woody sensibility that you get down there is one thing, but there's a whole other story about that place and what it represents, which I think is absolutely terrific. And I don't know quite of any other place associated with a school uh, like it. Another thing, actually this place was founded by people that today we would call students uh, and they created it because they were dissatisfied uh, with the conventional way by which people became architects and I think actually then as now ultimately the users of this place have a huge degree of control quite unlike I would say any other academic institution in the world let alone architecture schools and there'll be loads of people who say, well, you can't do that in the 21st century. You know, audit people, will you say, it's too disparate, um, and the students move on, they're just kind of five-year transients, and how can you possibly make an institution based on that? Let me tell you something, this institution has been based on exactly that since 1837. People who say, well, you can't do that, uh, lack imagination, um, because history suggests you absolutely can. And part of the outcome of that, I think, is that the AA's international network, if I can call it that, I think is kind of unrivaled. You know, you, you can go anywhere in the world and you can just check out on that network. No doubt it could be more efficient. No doubt it could be better funded. No doubt it could be this and that and this and that. But it does exist and actually it's a fantastic calling card to any recent graduate from this place who wants to make a phone call, you're going to get a hearing uh, from your fellow alumni um, around the world. And I think this is a, a, a very, very strong part of the AA's appeal, to which I would add, <clears throat> in a sense it's part of it, AA did. I'm assuming, I don't know, um, that the siren voices of, well, why can't we just be BA and MA like everywhere? Well, why should you be? AA did is a fantastic kind of set of initials. You see AA dip and you immediately make some sort of assumption that at least that person's probably, on average, going to be rather more free thinking, rather more international, rather more just kind of lively and prepared to have an argument than you might say would be the case from anywhere school uh, with this absolutely impeccable set of audited monikers. So my strong advice is don't spit on your luck and for God's sake don't give up something which you, is unique uh, in favour of something which isn't, um, which is literally and metaphorically a commonplace. And the other thing, <clears throat> there's no danger of this being given up, is uh, London, Bedford Square, this building, which is a rather extraordinary combination of history and modernity, uh, of urbanism on the one hand, but the curious feeling that you're in a house uh, on the other. I mean, I've never been in an, any architecture school which in any sense uh, resembles what it is that you have here. Not so long ago people were saying, oh we're going to have to sell up, we'll never raise the money, we won't be able to buy the lease, we won't be able to do the library, we won't be able to buy number 37, we'll never get the bookshop out of the basement. It's all nonsense. And in fact the history of the AA is taking on challenges, relishing the challenges, 
and in a kind of rather impeccable architectural manner, which sometimes means going backwards for a couple of years, having huge rows about stuff, being elliptical rather than the engineer's perfect linear path to success. But actually, if you look at this place uh, over the last two or three decades, I would say it's an extraordinary success story. The money was raised. The library is being done. You did buy number 37. The bookshop has moved out of the basement, etc., etc., etc. And that's why I think at a time when the kind of internal concerns and anxieties would say, oh, everything's not as good as it <coughs> used to be, and everything's a worry, and, you know, why are there so many people here, and why is it expensive? You know, all that sort of stuff, I think it's just looking at things from the wrong end of the telescope. And on any reasonable view about the health and life of this institution, you're on a winner. And the big mistake will be to misunderstand that and to think, actually, we're on a loser. Why don't we try a different feed? Why don't we try a new race course? Why don't we get a different jockey? You are going to get a different jockey, but actually it's a jockey that's coming to a stable, if I could include on this slightly f forced analogy, uh, is coming to a stables which has bred a hell of a lot of winners. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Paul, you, you mentioned uh, toward the end of your remarks something about the place <laughs> of Bedford Square, and I know Mark had a question for you loosely connected to this notion of domestic space as opposed yeah, to I, something I, else. First of all, um, whoever was responsible for putting in cut flowers here, may I salute them and congratulate them. Um, I want to make the point that one of the exceptions is that we live in, in effect, domestic space. As opposed to what? I mean, I would say, I mean, if you doubt me, amble up to the Bartlett, uh, <laughs> where you will see par excellence, institutional space. We celebrate, in a sense, the virtues of domestic space, taken in a slightly idealistic fashion, um, in the sense that, as far as possible, the AA refuses the definition of being an institution. I mean, at one level, at a more constitutional level, it's because it says it's a community. But at a material level, and it's that level that I'm going to speak about, um, it's like a house, a domestic house. The connections between the houses, the corridor at the top, is, how can we say, it is so perfectly in keeping uh, with the AA that it's very remarkable, and everyone thinks it's been there for decades. Now, it being a kind of non-institution, uh, as against institution, what does that mean? It means that you're not called upon or called by the institution at every turn. Who could doubt that there's a link between that and the permission and indeed the encouragement to be independent. I mean, I think we now have an incredibly nice uh, health and safety officer, but I think we should persuade her to see what like the legal minimum of uh, exit, fire exit. It's the adventures of that little green stick man or white stick man on a ground of green. Uh, for those of you who haven't thought about it, if you go outside and turn left through the main door, there is a little 18th century, little bas relief of classical children, putty, playing naked uh, and full of joy. But it's almost masked by the green man 
in which someone is informing you that that door is a fire exit. <laughs> I mean, you're all architectural students. I mean, even non-architects tend to know what a door is. Uh, it cannot be serious that we need it for information. That's not why those signs appear in institutions. They appear in a way to underline the fact that this is an institution. I was doing a paper on this once. So I went round and f uh, to see what institutions have the most signage. The answer was universities uh, and hospitals. And then I thought, I'll check out, like, where has the least? Strangely enough, it was churches and expensive restaurants. And, you know, you might think they're onto something. But it's not about the signage. It's, it's about the way those things are a sign of who we are. Our independence, our informality, our refusal to subordinate ourselves, you know. I mean, imagine, what would you put if the AA were suddenly called upon to have, you know, a huge mission statement? I mean, uh, I'm sure we have one, but it's probably quite robust and short. We don't need those institutional trappings. We often ask, why is it people come here and, in, and like it? They just enjoy the place, including our students and including our staff. Partly that's by a certain cultivation of the domestic. Um, Alvin would always make sure that there were cut flowers, even if the bank was phoning him saying that no more checks would be honored. Uh, because it's a space, an non-institutional space is able to be space that's cared for. And all of us who enjoy it owe an enormous debt of gratitude to those who clean it, re-clean it every day. Not just in terms of cleaning, but in terms of everybody who enables us to come in uh, to such a pleasurable space. To work now it makes it sound almost or it could sound as though what i'm saying is conservative like let's maintain all the traditions etc etc on the contrary each generation of people uh, at the aa staff and students have the task of adjusting what they think is valuable in the aa to what is becoming necessary, and in that sense, good, in terms of the culture beyond. In that sense, I don't take TDAP uh, as some kind of imposition upon us. If we're going to do well and kind of survive, we need to do this. On the contrary, it turns out that it's actually quite a welcome exercise in improving ourselves in areas where, frankly, we weren't very good. Uh, and so these reforms, instead of being seen themselves as institutional uh, invasion, should be seen as an opportunity to maintain those things which we love and wouldn't trade away, together with an enormously improved way of working. <laughs> Certainly the ac academic and cultural life of the school could be very seriously improved. And this will give us a way of testing it. So I think everything starts from this domestic space, this non-institutional space. And you can kind of link everything to that. It means, of course, that some things happen in, as happen in houses, more than institutions. I think, well, especially if you were here two weeks ago, 
There's more crying here uh, than in most places. In fact, I think there's actually rather more crying here than in psychiatric wards. Um, but that's, that's what it is. Crying is no bad thing. I'll leave it there. Well, I think this, this point about regulation is, is, is absolutely fascinating because the, the thing about, you know, it, being able to award degrees is absolutely, absolutely fine. Just get on with it. Um, it, it you know, that's, that falls into that category of everything that must, must change in order to remain the same. It doesn't alter the fundamental character of the place um, or, or its history. The danger is the concomitant things which people think you then have to start doing in order to be like those places that already give degrees. This is, this is the danger that you start taking in parts of actually a non-existent passage and it's a bit like, oh, we've got to do better than regulation. Why should we do the minimum? Why don't we do the maximum? You know, why don't we have two fire exit signs? You know, why don't we have an even faster running man? Have you ever noticed how weird the word of regulation is? The first thing they tell you, don't run if there's a fire, yet the signs all show somebody running. I mean, the kind of the, the graphic sort of peculiarity, it's like you have to have that arrow, but you also have to have the words exit, really? There's a person running and there's an arrow, but you've got to add that extra thing in because there's a regulation that tells you that. Now, you probably have to have that, but there will be other things as you change which you do not have to have, but there'll be some enthusiast. In other words, the very worst, not the best, of, of kind of health and safety zealots is that it always has to be more. And you can never overload something to the point where it becomes nonsensical. And if you want proof positive of how that works, you know, you can see many London streets where the combination of street markings, which actually look extraordinarily like kind of... Um, I've seen markings on London streets that remind me of Lagos. But it's not enough to have markings on the pavements or the streets. You've then got to have the explanatory sign, the engineer's pole, every 30 metres telling you, giving you an explanation of what the markings on the road mean, and so on and so forth. And I think it's that sense of overload, because the AA is kind of agile and light-footed, and that's what you have to try to avoid. The, the thing to me about the, the, this point about domestic is whether, whether by design or, or chance. The creation of the unit system was a sort of intergenerational thing. You know, there'd be a lot of people mourning David Marks, rest in peace, uh, who, who's just died. You know, he joined a unit at the AA, and for, for a whole load of people, not in the same year, you know, a real mixture of people across the school who will be remembering him in quite different ways about the effect that he had on their life. It wasn't the class, it was the gang. You might even say, it's a loaded word now, but you might even say the unit system. You know, these were the little families that occupied this house. Mm. And it then goes further than that because the nature of the AA itself, the AA Council, and the fact that it is an association, not just a school, uh, means that the association becomes, if you like, and again, it's another loaded word now with certain specific meanings in the context of the AA, but you might think of that as a community. Those people who've been here, those people who've joined it for some reason or another, who are not at the school, who don't teach, and they're not students, but they're never, nevertheless part of this wider thing. And there's something about that when people come here uh, for an evening event, which is quite different to going to you know, the common room of the university, usually deadening places with kind of regulation furniture. And I think that that, it, that creates a kind of different atmosphere in this place, which runs right through from people who, who just arrived this term, right through to the sort of octogenarians, some of whom will just about remember Conduit Street, where the AA used to exist before it moved to Bedford Square. It hasn't been here forever. And I think actually understanding the history of this building and its origins is itself a fascinating exercise in the relationship between school and education and, and the life of, of a long-term institution.
Paul, you mentioned um, the fragility of our constitutional arrangement. The students really have the power to vote in and out uh, the head of our administration. <coughs> in your experience, looking at the AA back a few decades, um, can you point out some highs and lows and other moments where a search brought out certain unexpected um, consequences? Uh, as we look to going forward, as you say, it might be useful to look backwards briefly. Well, the most significant appointment, of course, was, was Alvin Boyarsky, because this is when the AA revolted and asserted its independence with a very vibrant student body who did not want to be taken over by Imperial College. You know, I, they probably didn't like imperialism. Who knows? Imperial tried to take over the Bartlett, and that failed as well when the Bartlett found that they'd been sending surveyors around, eyeing up their properties. Um, and the AA, to its eternal credit, wasn't going to have it. Um, and if, if, if Imperial had got its hands on this place, I mean, this wouldn't exist now. I'm sure they'd have sold it off. They'd have probably installed some of their own academic um, big weeks in here. And the AA, if it existed at all, would be an outpost, probably down at White City in those vibrant new office towers masquerading as, academic, as an academic institution. Um, so that was an absolutely critical moment. And of course, Alvin, um, dis despite erroneous beliefs that, you know, Brett wanted more powers and he wanted this and he wanted that. Let me tell you something, Alvin Boyarsky had a lot more power than any subsequent uh, chairman or chief executive or whatever the nomenclature was. And a lot of students were misled, I believe, quite wrongly about, um, about you know, all the, 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 the chief becoming too powerful, he wants more power. But Alvin was an absolute tyrant, and the AA needed a tyrant at that point because it was the only way it was going to survive. It was under huge pressure, um, and it was kind of led to this extraordinary flowering of, of, uh, of talent and inquiry and debate which, by the way, was extremely pluralist. So, you know, you had your, eventually to become a uh, neoclassical architect, however one wants to describe him, like Dmitri Porfirius. You know, um, I mean, Dmitri taught Zaha. Dmitri pushed Zaha um, in the way of Rem and, and uh, Ilya Zengelis because they didn't want to take her, but Dimitri and a couple of other people, no, 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 you've got to take her, you've got to take her, and they did, and that actually changed the course of recent architectural history, and it all came out of here, and it all came out of an intellectual ferment. Now, the biggest problem, actually, was, was, when, Alvin, uh, was, was when Alvin died, and Alvin, I think, if you'd said to Alvin that he would have gone on as long as he had done. He even told you to fuck off because that wasn't really the plan, but it kind of, as often happens, it turned into the plan. He loved the place so much, he couldn't give it up. And actually, he became almost impossible to replace. And I've always felt um, a great deal of sympathy for a man who was persuaded to come here, Alan Balfour. He had a very, very nice job elsewhere. Um, was persuaded to come here in a sense slightly against his better judgment and I think he had a pretty torrid time. There were people who would never forgive him because he wasn't Alvin. I mean, was it his fault that Alvin died? Of course not. But he was kind of, he, he had to put up with this sort of endless, endless world of comparison. Well, Alvin wouldn't have done that and it's not as good as it used to be. You know, Peter Cook had gone down the road because kind of Peter should have taken over, but, you know, Peter's friend said, you know, Peter, if you take over, we'll never speak to you again. You can't replace Alvin. So, you know, he, he goes to Bartlett. And again, a little history of, of, uh, of, of recent architectural education takes an entirely uh, different course. And the personalities and the, the opinions involved, that wasn't so much about the AA. It's about the whole relationship of a whole set of individuals. And I think all one can say is, you know, um, Moise and Mostafavi uh, came in with quite a big groundswell and was perceived to have done a good job. He, he, he snapped up Hook Park just like that. And no one moved quicker than Moisen when an opportunity for the AA uh, uh, arose. And yet, and yet, you know, then Brett came in. My observation is that in, ever since Alvin, every time there's a new appointment, 
it is in a position of what you might describe as crisis, I'd describe it as pressure. There hasn't been a moment in recent history where the appointment of somebody new at the AA hadn't been, hasn't been surrounded by a combination, probably an element of unpleasantness. Let's not forget that botched but nearly successful attempt to get rid of Brett not that so long ago before, before his recent decision uh, uh, to move. And I think that you just accept that the AA is a different place. Of course there's pressure. Of course there are intense feelings. Of course there's crying. I don't think that any of those people who've, who've gone uh, have left happily. Um, and I'm bound for, I know for certain facts, just feels very bitter about the whole thing, even though in certain respects the school did extremely well under, under his leadership. The pressure is nothing new. I think you just have to assume that's the normal situation for the AA. It may not be normal elsewhere, but actually my observations are it's just more public at the AA. I'll give you one example of this. When the Bartlett finally got round to replacing Peter Cook, they advertised for a world-class practicing architect who could take on this important role. Who did they appoint? A French philosopher who's never designed anything, he, although he has collected a lot of drawings. Migru's a brilliant man. I was on the selection panel. But let's not pretend that, oh, well, the AA is always a problem, but it's always so well done in these other places because they have more conventional procedures and they have nice, uh, you know, hefki or whatever it's called, approval governance things, and it's oh so hunky-dory. Let me tell you something about governance in British public life. One scratch and it all falls apart. It's a sick joke. And actually, I rather like the Honest of the A with its public kind of evisceration of inadequate candidates in front of, guess who, users, um, and, and not the usual secretive little uh, selection committee. To be fair to the Bartlett, they did have, copying the AA, they did have open um, uh, talks that the candidates for that particular job could give. Frankly, there was only one candidate who, uh, who, who fitted the bill in terms of the formal advertisement, who was Patrick Schumacher. He was a world-class architect and he taught, well, in fact, taught here, um, and very successfully. And um, unfortunately, Patrick, <laughs> Uh, in his usual Patrick way, um, which is, what could we say? Um, <laughs> too clever by not quite a half, shall we say. And in response to a rather impersonal question from the, ordinance, uh, from the audience about, you know, the Bartlett being elitist and what was he going to do about poor students, etc., 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 somebody asked a question that is the equivalent of a punch in the face. And Patrick just responded in kind and said, well, why can't they go to South Bank? Oh, now, oh, this caused, and if you know Patrick, you realise, good for you, Patrick. Somebody's just tried to punch you in the face, and you punched them right back. Um, and, of course, this caused mayhem you know, amongst the Liberals down at the Bartlett. How dare he say that? They didn't even realise that in saying that he's being rude about the South Bank, it only reflected their own <coughs> prejudices about that institution, how much cleverer they were than the people down at the Elephant and Castle. Anyway, he basically wrote himself out... This is not being recorded, is it? No. Uh, well, Patrick wrote himself out the script because um, there was a sort of round robin, I think, of all the teachers who were at that public event, um, and they sort of signed a thing saying that under no circumstances would they continue to teach at the Bartlett if Patrick became the head. He nevertheless did get his final interview and uh, performed very creditably, and... Um, Personally, I think it might have been rather interesting if he had been appointed, because uh, as an observer, occasional observer of academic life, I would say about 90% of the people who said they refused to serve under him would have done a very, very rapid reversal. With the quarter of the hour still left to us, I thought we could open it up to the floor, in part because uh, Paul's put forward five things that might be exceptional about this place. I don't think he's covered all the ground in the world in that regard. You might know something exceptional you'd like to announce or reflect upon. I would say exceptional doesn't necessarily mean good. Uh, and we could, we could look at those things as well. But uh, if you're guided by that or some other thing you'd like to talk with uh, Paul and bring to the floor, I'd open, I'd open the room. Brian. The, 
that the AA has a, an unusual relation to the British uh, profession and the RIBA? Well, I think that's true because for, for quite a long period it was, it, it was the, really the only real international school. Um, and that made it simultaneously um, exotic um, and non-conforming. Uh, there have been a number of people who have been president of both the RIBA and the AA. And in fact, if, if you look at the sort of, what could we call them, the upper echelons of, of uh, English architectural society, um, the AA features very widely, actually. And I'm, I'm not just talking about the, you know, the sort of um, the Richard Rogers generation. I mean, it extends a, a lot further down that chain. I think that, you know, I don't know that any school should worry about its relationship with the RIBA, except in the sense that, you know, when, when the visiting boards come round, you have to do your stuff. Um, the ARB, to me, is a sort of utterly pointless waste of time, and you have to pay it lip service because that's what you do. The ARB is the ultimate example of the sort of organisation that is loved by people who love regulation for regulation's sake. You know, it's a replicant body that serves no useful purpose. It was wound up tomorrow morning. I'll tell you one thing. There might be a few people in Hallam Street shedding a tear as they saw, the, saw their gold-plated pensions going down the drain. Wouldn't be any tears anywhere else uh, in the universe. It's utterly useless. I think there's one interesting thing, however, which I personally think that the, the AA... If it's done it, 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 it should have made more of it, which is its relationship to London. I mean, I'm always amazed when I see some extraordinary projects which have been generated as a result of being in this city. But I wouldn't say that I'm hugely conscious, you know, does the AA have a more profound relationship in the sort of work and examination research it's done in relation to the future of London compared with other architecture schools? I'm not too sure about that. And I personally rather regret that, especially given the AA and, and its location here. And I think actually one, an interesting thing would be to try, to try to develop, I don't mean sort of going and sucking up to the mayor or the GLA, but I mean actually addressing the issues that London faces in perhaps, in perhaps a slightly more, um, a slightly more, I don't want to use the word plan, but a slightly more committed way. I'd love to see a show, for example, of, of anything that the school has done which has been based on London and its conditions. Because this town <coughs> has been in such a state of extraordinary flux and pressure which shows no sign of going away whatsoever. And I think actually, you know, it's kind of the place for sort of fecund examinations. And I, 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 I would almost say that there's an element of the A that could almost redefine itself as being London's architecture school precisely because it's not, you know, North London as was, or London Met, or East London, precisely because it is so international and internationalist. And that might become a strength rather than what seems to me to be pretty much like anywhere else. Hi, thanks so much. Um, there were two things that were said which put together, uh, I think, reflect maybe larger concerns. I mean, Mark was talking about the relationship between the domesticity and the kind of anti-institutional institution of the AA, which I think for those of us who've been here a long time, and maybe even those of, who have only been here a couple of weeks, will know that's perhaps the thing that we, the, the, the thing that we gravitated towards the most. It's also, it seems to me, the core of its mythology somehow. Um, Certainly as a teenager at school when I got my first AA or prospectus, it looked like no other university prospectus. That, I mean, it, made, it kind of made no sense. And in that way, things that don't make sense have a particular allure to them. Uh, but then, then Paul mentioned the fact that when Alvin came in, the AA, to quote you, the AA needed a tyrant, you know. And, and, and then I'm just sort of thinking about, uh, I suppose, larger you know, larger global currents, which we, I, I feel like we have to think about, you know. If we think about the, the fastest growing economies over the last 15 years, most have not been democracies. They're forms of state capitalism, whether it's the Chinese party, whether it's kind of Gulf capitalism. 
Secondly, we have a new form of, um, it seems that the, 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 the point in history where, where democracy actually is, is perversely a democracy that elects leaders who are actually enemies of democracy. So whether it's Putin, Erdogan, Trump, of course. <clears throat> and then thirdly, the, the most valuable companies today, um, Apple, Google, uh, were all startups, um, relatively young. And there's been a tendency also um, in corporate culture, uh, having seen the kind of um, this incredible wealth generation and also power concentration that these new startups have um, now, now possess, um, that age-old corporations um, want to become startups again. So it, they, they sort of, they think that they can um, literally uh, sort of impregnate it themselves with the startup culture, you know, uh, which is of course the equivalent of a 60-year-old man growing a ponytail uh, and wearing leather chaps. Um, so I just, uh, I think one of the, I, I, I only mention these things because I think we are, um, I think one of the beauties of being in this building is, are all those qualities that, that Mark outlined. Um, but I, I feel like, which, which leads to a certain kind of uh, ambience, a certain kind of introspection. Um, and, and, that, and when you talked about its relationship to London, it's, it's, it's a perverse relationship to London. I think that's what makes it special because we're both here and not here at the same time. But I wonder whether we could, how much we, we ought to feel obliged to position ourselves within these larger currents because there's something very interesting that, that this relationship between democracy and, and, ty and tyrant Tyrancy? I don't think that's a word. Uh, tyranny. Democracy and tyranny, um, which has obviously evolved over the last 20, 30 years within the world. And I wonder how we can reflect on that, because it, 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 they're in close proximity here in the AA as well. Well, I, I mean, I, I see your point, but I kind of wonder. Um, actually, first of all, I mean, Alvin, I don't think was a tyrant. Certainly not constitutionally, because at any time, the school could have got rid of him. Uh, so there's a, a big qualification there, and they belong to a generation which was quite you know, capable of doing that. If you're looking around, in a sense, in that area, I mean, I think it was true he was a patriarch. I mean, in a sense, which carries some of the same connotations. Uh, but it allows it to be represented that people just didn't go around saying that guy's a total tyrant. I mean, they also actually liked him uh, and submitted willingly, unwillingly. I mean, uh, sometimes screaming like your ex-employer. Um, you know, it wasn't, uh, I don't think it's tyranny. And indeed the mechanism of, uh, you know, I mean, in that sense, you could say, if, if the AA has tyrants, I mean, it's, it's tyranny, at a constitutional level, it's tyranny tempered by assassination. Um, something like the last days of the Roman Republic. Uh, but I, I kind of feel that, in a sense, we're, we're kind of evidencing some of the things we want to preserve, but without putting them enough, you know, we haven't asked, I think, seriously enough, what is it to preserve something? You only preserve things like that when they're active, living, and in a current state of affairs. And it's that current state of affairs which we need all the intelligence. My, my feelings about the fact that regulation might actually turn out to be quite good, rather than bad. I mean, it's only a small anecdote, and it wouldn't have great evidential value. But I do remember when we were in a committee being asked by them, this was the, I can't remember their name, so. Um, and someone suddenly said around the table, how long would it be before the AA spotted that a student wasn't there or had gone missing. <laughs> and someone put up their hand and said, 
uh, on average, I think about three days. And I saw this kind of, the, the inspector, his eyes involuntarily raised. <laughs> Obviously, if you ask that question in a university, they say, well, certainly at the beginning of next term. And, you know, if you, if you unpack what's at stake in knowing within three days, you see how close, if informal, the relations between staff and students, students and students are here. And you could just tell from his expression that, you know, that was like a one-up to us. Yeah, I think the point is, um, Alvin was brought in, as it were, to behave like a tyrant. I mean, he personally, you know, he wasn't a tyrant in the sort of... Um, Greek or Roman sense, and of course, as Mark said, it's true. Um, he could have been deposed at any point, and in fact, I can remember one summer party being bombarded with leaflets from one unit or other, you know, demanding that Alvin should immediately go. Um, but, you know, possibly like the Catalans, there were a hell of a lot of other people who were perfectly happy for him to stay. And I, we should actually say this about the AA Constitution, because although at a certain level, you can say that the students and the users have ultimate power. But rather like the British Constitution, actually, it's not as simple as that. Um, the AA is actually trust. It's governed by trust law. And the people who are uh, responsible um, are AA councillors, whether they know it or not. Not only are they trustees and therefore answerable to the Charity Commission, they are personally financially liable uh, for uh, what goes on here. So. There's a sort of quite an interesting balance. I think all one can say is that any leader of this inst institution that has utterly lost the support of the student body has had it. Um, but it's not quite as simple as um, being deposed by a show of hands in a single meeting. And there are points when, where the AA Council itself uh, might have to ignore um, uh, certain votes if, if they were illegal. And I think that really comes back to this, um, this wider question about governance, which is all, all governance take place, takes place within the context of far wider laws than the specific things that, that relate to them. And every so often you find that you know, there are rules and regulations governing any sort of institution uh, which turn out to be illegal. And I think the messiness of constitutional uh, arrangements mm -hmm. is a useful bulwark, actually, um, against uh, any, any form of tyranny, in fact. And the AA is no different in that respect to any other institution. It's slightly unusual because it is, it is an association. It's not a university department. You know, it is totally uh, independent in a quite different way. Um, to any other school of architecture in this country, with the possible exception of the London School of Architecture, which I think is your start-up model, bearing in mind that it is itself dependent um, on an existing corpus mm. that it can attach itself to. So I think that's a, it's a very interesting idea. My observation, not being an architect, is that actually when I see, if I go to Cripps and I see the projects that are coming through from first or any other year, what I do think is that architecture schools have within them this extraordinary uh, method of self-renewal because the projects become different and actually the lifeblood of the, of, of the thing changes because the students themselves are different. They choose who they want to be taught by and the really big change in recent years obviously has been technology, which over 30 years has 100% changed the way that architecture is made, or maybe 40 years. And the other thing is globalization. I think one of the big uh, questions for anyone now leading an international school is why precisely anyone has to travel anywhere to learn anything? Um, because clearly they don't. And I think that, again, brings a focus back in, onto why London and if you're coming to London, given you could go to seven schools or whatever it is, you know, why this one? And that, I think, actually does focus on the mind. What exactly is special about this place? And I think the more one thinks about that, I think if one's thinking about 
the upsides in the first instance. Because don't you think it's, it's a bit like Tolstoy's thing about families, you know, all, all happy families are essentially the same. Unhappy families are unhappy, each in its own particular way. And I think actually looking at the upsides and how you enhance and enrich those is a far better route to go down than the, the kind of internal worries about things we do that might not be quite as good as somewhere else. By all means, learn, but don't forget your own strengths. I think on that note, as we promised an hour, we've only booked an hour at this Love Hotel, but the important thing is there are four more quickies this week, all at one o'clock. Next uh, Tuesday, tomorrow, Ed Bottoms will be with us on what was originally going to be titled Everything You Wanted to Know About the AA But Were Afraid to Ask, but has now become a complete history of the Architectural Association, heavily abridged, uh, so we'll make our time. Uh, but it's been a pleasure, Paul, to have you with us this hour and to kick off this series of uh, conversations with you. I'll see everyone uh, with Mark Cousins tomorrow this time. Do bring your lunch. We'll see you then.